And so these are some of the, the, the teachings going on in, in Judaism, in the Greek and Roman culture. And so as we think of those early decades, what's going on in those the very early years of Christianity when it comes to doctrine? Well, first, we have to see that, that doctrine is developing in those early decades. decades right? It's gradually being revealed. Now, because of this gradual revelation, we actually begin to see differing forms of Christianity. Now, be careful. There is a way that Jesus intended for us to follow. But, as we look at Acts, as we look at the letters of Paul, we see clearly that there were people who put their own spin sometimes on the Christian message. And so you have this kind of Judaic form of Christianity developing, right? Those people that were going out in the Gentile world telling them that you have to be sacrificed, uh, you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the, the laws of Moses. Right? And so you have this kind of Judaic form of Christianity. You also see within the latter chapters of Acts that James, for example, is still very connected to a lot of Jewish tradition, whereas Paul had abandoned a lot of Jewish tradition, even though at times he will uh, keep it. We can see throughout the New Testament that there were groups of people that identified themselves as Christians that claimed the resurrection had already taken place. John, in his letters, deals with people that, that believed that Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh. Right? So you're having you know, what, what should be a unified message is getting all these kind of spin-offs and, and variations about it as well. Essentially, what the apostles are trying to do is to lay out what Jesus had done. But that's gradually taking place. And sometimes other teachers are stepping up to try and fill in some of these gaps, or perceived gaps, I should say. But also, it's a time period in those early decades of, you know, gradually laying out how to worship, or how churches should be organized, the establishment of elders, right? all sorts of things are taking place. But they're, they're taking place gradually. It's not, um, it's not all in place immediately, in every place. Right? And so while you might see some things in Jerusalem, because of you know, the 12 being there, uh, so much has taken place, it, it becomes a mature church much more rapidly than some of these other churches that are starting. What questions about the doctrines, the teachings of this time period? Let's talk about developing Christian practice. So as Christian, Christianity is, is developing, what kind of things are, are taking place? Well, one thing to note uh, is that Christianity gradually moves from the synagogues to house churches. As many of these Jews begin accept, accepting Jesus as the Messiah in places outside of Jerusalem especially, they would often be expelled, kicked out of the synagogue. And so Jewish Christians uh, began to worship in houses, sometimes public places where they could meet. And so that is kind of a new form for a lot of these individuals, being so used to the, the synagogues. A second issue of practice we've already kind of highlighted, what do you do about the Law of Moses? What needs to be kept? Right? And we talk about how some people claim circumcision uh, had to be kept. We see both Paul and James involved in vows and offerings, but it doesn't appear like that was something that the Gentiles were necessarily expected to keep. What about the Sabbath? And of course, Paul in Romans 14 makes the observation uh, makes 
uh, observation of food laws or holidays, a matter of conscience that shouldn't be placed on other people. And so if you did it to the Lord, right, you observed the Sabbath to the Lord, observe the Sabbath. But if somebody else doesn't observe the Sabbath, right, a Gentile Christian, don't judge them. Right, because that, that's not, uh, it's a matter of conscience. Very important in early Christianity, of course, was the practice of communion of the Lord's Supper. Eventually, toward the end of the first century or in the beginning of the second century, this practice will be referred to as the Eucharist. The Eucharist comes from a Greek word meaning to give thanks, right? Because Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks for it, and then broke it and said, this is my body. Right? And so that term is, comes from the Greek to give thanks, and eventually gets used to refer to the practice of communion. The, the, the practice of communion and gathering of these followers of Jesus is, primary, is, is focused around the first day of the week. So even though a lot of those early Jewish followers early followers of Jesus were Jewish, they begin to shift from the Sabbath as being the focus to the first day of the week. Why? Why the sudden shift? Uh, right, the resurrection, which means that, that if the resurrection hadn't actually happened, right, and it was made up, as some people would like to suggest, that doesn't seem, like a, a fake story doesn't seem to be enough to su suggest why this suddenly changed. You know, the, the fully adopting the first day of the week. And so I think the fact that there's this transition is a tangential proof of the authenticity of the resurrection. Because they adopt it very quickly that the first day of the week is the day to worship God and to worship Jesus. Other practices, of course, are, are things that you're familiar with. Preaching, the sharing of the message, very important for those early Christians. Baptism, and when you go through Acts, of course, you see um, you know, the, the, the sharing of the message and the people being baptized into Christ. Very important part of early Christian uh, practice was music. Music had been prominent in the synagogues, um, and so it, you know it, it continues even into early Christianity. Most of the early hymns would probably have been the Psalms, but eventually new hymns would be written. Also prominent among uh, many early Christians was a regular practice of fasting. Historically, it seems by the second century at the latest, there were quite a few Christians fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, you know, kind of opposite Jewish fast days. Let's talk a little bit about geographic spread at this time, right? And so, you know, we, we think of, we're, we're in the time period of Acts and slightly after is where we're thinking. And so, Jesus, of course, lays out in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that plan, right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. And largely, that is what happened, is Christians followed that plan. Because we need to remember what we have in Acts is some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. It's predominantly focused on the actions of Peter for the first half, and then Paul. But remember, thousands of people are becoming Christians. What are they doing? Well, we know by Acts 8, at the very least, they are scattered abroad preaching the Word due to the persecution of Saul of Tarsus. 
There are some early traditions about the, the apostles that suggest that some apostles, uh, maybe as far as Spain. In fact, when you think of uh, how the Spanish would name some places San Diego, which means St. James, that you can see there's these traditions early on that, that James makes it to Spain, not James the brother of the Lord, or James the brother of the Lord, not James the Apostle who was killed in Acts 12. Some traditions put Thomas as far as India. These are legends, so we're not sure exactly how historically reliable they are. But it appears that the apostles and those early Christians went wherever they could, preaching the word. What do you do about the Ethiopian unit, right? I mean, here's a man who goes on his way rejoicing, and he's an official in Ethiopia. Would he have stopped talking about it by the time he gets back to Ethiopia? No. So there's people all over the place. And so we can't just say, well, you know, these 12 men did all sorts of things. Yeah, they did, but then there's the thousands of others that their lives came into contact with who then, you know, um, influenced thousands upon thousands of others. And so Saul's persecution is just one example of this spread to preaching the word. So much so that Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, that the gospel had been preached to the whole world. Well, kind of Paul, right? I mean, you know, we, we allow Paul some, some uh, hyperbole there. I mean, he's focused on the, the Roman world, right? Because it probably hasn't made it to the Americas, for example. But the idea is that the gospel has spread, right? It has spread as far as it could because of the people being convinced of the truthfulness of that message. I want to close with talking about some things, some thoughts about culture and society. And again, you know, we're breathing through this because you've got this in Book of Acts or you've heard it, uh, so, some of these things, uh, maybe throughout your life in Bible classes, and so we're just kind of setting the foundation. So how did Christians view the society in which they were a part of? Well, if we simply go by what we have, we don't have much, because predominantly what we have is the New Testament from this period. Now, gradually we'll have more and more writings from other Christians, but what we have is the New Testament. And when we think about what the New Testament says on this subject, there's, there's not a ton of material, especially when we think about things like relationship between church and state and some other things that we might think of when it comes to um, culture and society. When, when it comes to thinking about church and state, we have uh, Romans chapter 13, actually the only like the first seven or eight verses of Romans 13. We have a couple verses in 1 Peter 2. And then we could probably say there's some views of, of government in Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 17. So there's not a lot of early Christian discussion about relationship to government. Instead, of course, we do get several places where uh, New Testament authors will contrast the church and the world, right? this entity or this uh, sphere of influence known as the world particularly about, you know, the opposition. You, you live in a situation that is antagonistic to the message of Jesus. But when it comes to the role of government, for example, right, when you look at the Old Testament, there's a lot said about government, predominantly because we're talking about a situation where it's a theocracy. Right? God lays down the law for the government to operate but it's not a main topic in the New Testament. And so things we might want to know, like, should we view government as a necessary evil? Or was government established in Eden before the fall, right? I mean, Adam is kind of given oversight of the garden. Is that a form of government, meaning God intended for government to be there? Or is government kind of meant to check our sinful impulses? I mean, other types of things that we can theologically ask. New Testament doesn't talk about those kind of things. A lot of the focus when it comes to the relationship between the church and society is on 
how to live a Christian life in society. Encouragement to modesty, which is not just about dress, but is instead about you know the quietness of spirit, uh, you know attitudes of, of humility, right? Those kind of things. Although yes, dress fits into that somewhat. We tend to emphasize the dress aspect more often than not. But essentially, Jesus and the New Testament writers are encouraging these Christians to live morally radical lives. That then there's something distinct about what it means to be a Christian in this, in this first century period than what it means to be a Roman citizen. Right? And so having this strong moral compass, a strong moral center, was very important for those early Christians as they thought about you know, how do we relate to the world around us. Questions or comments about culture and society uh, any of the things that we've touched on here. On Tuesday, we'll, we'll move into the second century and, and think about, you know, now that we've gotten after the time of the apostles, now that Christianity is kind of uh, thriving within the Roman Empire, what do we begin to see, especially in that time period where Rome starts looking at Christians as something distinct from Judaism and how they should fit in society. So we'll pick that up on Tuesday.